Chris Angel, and I'd like to welcome all of you to Las Vegas Creators United, episode one. I wrote an introduction for this guest because he means so much, so forgive me, but I have to read it. Iconic, childlike, sophisticated, surreal, revolutionary, wonder are just some words that have been used to describe the Dragon effect. Franco Dragon is the creative genius behind timeless shows here in Las Vegas and throughout the world. He has revolutionized how we think and experience what a show is and can be. He has embraced artistic history, but has broken the rules of theater and illustrated there are none but just one to connect to all people from every part of the world by something we all have as human beings, emotion. He is one of my biggest inspirations that I had the pleasure to work with, and I'm honored to call him a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Franco Dragon. What's up, Franco? Hello, Chris. Tell us, tell us a little bit about, before we get into your brain, the culmination of Las Vegas Creators Unite. Why did you decide to do something like this? You know, uh, Las Vegas has changed my life. And um, also all over the world, you know, we have our friends, colleague, all these uh, performers, artists, technician, stagehand, and uh, I am not in Las Vegas now. I am like a half of the humanity uh, confined in Europe. And um, I am connected and I always was connected with uh, my friends in uh, Las Vegas. I have a family in Las Vegas. I have uh, many friends, you know, there. And uh, when I follow the news, when I, I, I read what is happening over there, I can't imagine myself not trying to, to be there, to do something for some of our friends. Not everybody maybe needs, some people maybe have enjoyed to be confined, but I know that a lot of my friends, a lot of members of our family, Chris, are in difficulties. And so I have to say, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, to people like you, to have accepted to participate to this uh, uh, adventure. I don't know what will happen, but at least we try something. I don't want to see what's happening in the world, and I never wanted that. I never was like this, being watching what is happening without trying to do something. You know that every morning when we wake up, I know you <laughs> We want to change the world. This is our dream. This is our mission. But if we can just a little bit do something around us to change something, to help, this is our mandate. This is our mission. And it's why, Chris, I, uh, thanks to my friends, we have assembled these people around us to that they tell to us their relation with uh, Las Vegas. Voila, I, I hope I answered to you. Yes, of course. Well, it's a beautiful thing that you're doing. People are able to donate to help out this cause and our community, which uh, we're so very grateful uh, to you, Franco, and your team for coming up with this idea. I know Brian and Damien worked hard at it. So I'd like to get inside your brain because you know you really are truly the genius behind live show experience. Um, and I just wanna kind of get a sense of, I know you were born in Italy. I know you moved to Belgium, La Louvière, which I spent a year on and off there when you were seven years old. And I'd like to understand how and what kind of upbringing you had to introduce you into, I guess you were a performer first and then went to college and then became a director and a teacher. Just give us the genesis of that time yeah. of your life. Yeah, you know, I come from a very small village south of Italy, 
we have no seas. I am on the hill. I was born on a hill. And um, something that I tell always, it's about, you know, this uh, hill and there is the valley. And because we don't have a sea, we imagine a sea. And we start with our fantasy by imagining the dream. And, you know, my grandfather went in America. He did several times, you know, crossing the ocean with, by boat. I have family in, in New York. Normally, I was supposed to be in uh, America, but my father at that time only find a way to go in Belgium. And so I follow my father. And I, I grew up in Belgium. I became, I'm still Italian, actually, but I, I learned the French. I was never, never imagining that I would go in the theater or performing art. I was not uh, expected to go in that direction. You know, in my family, we are worker. Um, and my father you know, was not expecting me to do a job that he never thought that it was a job. We never imagined in our family that you could earn your life by doing uh, jugglers, uh, salting bank or actors. You know, it's something that in my family, you need to have a tie. It's why I don't have ties. You need to have a, a costume. You need to have a, a very a clear de destination, destiny. And, uh, but since I am a, a very young kid, I always, I'm afraid, you know, in my life to get bored. And so I always invented, my mother remind me just uh, this week that I was uh, six years old and once she left me at home and when she came back, I was uh, doing with the chairs of the house, I was doing a train. I always find a way to distract myself, always being, you know, inventing stories, inventing images, and then slowly by slowly going into uh, the college. Um, I met some teachers that really transformed my life and told that I was maybe talented enough to expect to be a performer. And you know, life and in our, in our profession, Chris, uh, there is someone that says, when you, you have an opportunity and you don't recognize that this is the chance of your life, if you don't get this opportunity, it's a professional mistake. And so I did some choice in my life that uh, really uh, guide me. And I, I start to do by accident actors and then because I needed to be director, I became director. But it was always with this uh, unconsciousness. I was not conscious that I was doing this or this. I was doing this just not to get bored and to make my life a little bit more better than what I was uh, living or what I was uh, expecting to, to, to be. So for me, it, all, it, what we do, uh, this is our mission to, to bring some happiness to the people. And at the same time, it's a way to forget that we're going to die. It's a way to touch the eternity. Voila. That's, uh, what, what was the first piece of theater that you saw that had a real influence in your life? Like, was it when you were a teenager or when you were in your 20s? Like, what did you see? I know, obviously, Peter Brook has inspired you tremendously. But was there a piece of theater that you saw before you discovered Peter Brook? Yeah, there, there is. I really clearly remember that I, I was before to come in Belgium. So I was six and a half years old. And in a, a, a school in Italy, I remember three actors, two men and one woman wearing beautiful costume and doing theater. And this really was in my mind. I loved. Then I have to say where I really get to uh, love the space, the theater, it was going to church. The church is so well organized. You know, you have the ritual. It's so theatrical that has re really in, it's, is in my brain. And then it was at the college. I met some, I was amazed 
when I was in Belgium, Belgium to hear how some teachers were controlling the language, the French. I was in admiration for those people that can talk very, very nicely, you know. And so I, then I, I, I met some friends, some teachers that brought me into theater. And slowly I became, I began to understand that this is something that you can do to earn your life. And I began to also to feel how much theater can change your own life. I began to feel how much theater can make you understand or at least question yourself about human being. And so Peter Brook came, Peter Brook came later uh, in, in uh, Paris, uh, Ariane Nushkin, Théâtre du Soleil. All these directors from the 70s impressed me a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, you, you know, what's interesting is your approach is so unorthodox and it, it stemmed even when you were in college, which blows my mind that you were putting together shows with non-actors to perform in it, whether you did stories about drug addicts or, 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 or folks on the street or people in prison, but you cast non-actors. So from that point, you obviously saw the world of theater very differently than tradition would have put forth. You know, that's, you know, I was in a traditional theater, classical theater, but when I saw that my friends were not going to theater, and when I realized myself how much theater performing actor might change your life, I decided to do theater with my friends. They were not uh, uh, actors. And uh, like this, I decided to go out of the classical theater. I wanted to be not doing theater for, for the people, but with the people. And this, I, I spent at least 10 years going from one group to another group and I, I experiment. Uh, like you see, you know, I was a, uh, with prisoners, with drug addict, with an immigrant, because theater is a, such a strong tool to understand li your life. Theater, performing, you need to move your from the from the chair. You cannot be doing theater, you know, without moving, without thinking. And so it's why I was actually that that was, I think, the best school for me to learn how to direct actors, how to coach actors, because I had to find, with these non-actors, I had to find a way to talk to them, to make them look good on stage. Otherwise, they would be foolish on stage, look full on stage. And so this school for me was a fantastic time where I learned how to talk where I learned how to pull out of someone the characters that he has inside of him or inside of her. Yeah, because you were teaching at the time also visual um, expression and you were working with actors and on movement character development way back then. And I guess in 1985, that's how you really um, you know, got noticed by Guy Lepete, who was just forming in 84, um, you know, Cirque du Soleil, and brought you on, I think, in 85 to work on your first show, because I, I think he was looking for something that wasn't three rings, didn't have animals, broke all the traditions of what circus meant uh, to that point, and kind of wanted to reinvent the definition of circus, and he saw you as an integral part of that creative process in order to, to bring that to life. And I guess he was on a journey, and, and his journey ended when he found you, because throughout your youth and your teenage years, you were able to cultivate and see things differently from a different lens than we've ever seen. And I guess that's why the marriage was, was, um, was made. You, you know, you are touching a point that uh, I, I would say that this is the 
most important story of my life. You know, I, I went in, in Quebec, in Montreal, by accident. I was never thinking that one day I would go in Montreal. And I went in Montreal because um, I knew a, a theater company that was doing the same kind of work that I was doing in, in Belgium, working, you know, with uh, non-actors. And, and then I was there and I, I, I began to teach to the circus school. And yes, Guy, in 85, he asked me if I would um, want, and if I could direct the show of Cirque du Soleil. I have to say, I didn't think one second. I say, yes. And then uh, I, I went in, into the, the journey. But very, very soon, I felt that we were living a very important story in our life. Guy, you know, we say in French, he has the nose and he has the eyes. I think Guy is a magician. He can recognize the people to be surrounded. And I, I have to say, I, I owe um, uh, all my friends in Montreal and Cirque du Soleil was the best adventure, the best journey. And yes, in 85, we jumped like innocent in a new journey without we did not know what would happen what was to happen but there start a love story that lasts for me last forever although i only stay 15 years in montreal but um, still today you know um, it's the most important uh, uh, part of my life yeah, tell us about when you were um creating like the uh, when you first came to vegas i guess creating nouvelle experience it was a different Las Vegas. You had Siegfried and Roy, um, who kind of dominated the entertainment scene. They transform, you know, this city uh, into a, a family destination. You know, they were doing things that had never been done, the spectacle, animals, all of these things. And then you were bringing uh, essentially a, a, a new version of a circus in a tent in a parking lot. And what was that first experience with Vegas like? Yeah, yeah. Las Vegas, you know, again, this is also the way we have been, I think, really guided by Guy. You know, he had this vision of Las Vegas. And so Nouvelle Experience was a show we did in Montreal. We created Montreal. Then Steve saw the show in uh, Toronto. And we brought the show in the back of the Mirage. And, uh, you know, for me, Las Vegas was something that it, it was, you know, from a European was the far west. And uh, uh, I never expected that I would stay there for a, a long time. And uh, yes, something that uh, we, we witnessed very fast that I remember when I saw the first time Siegfried and Roy, wow, you know, I never saw magic like this. I never saw a theater like this. I never saw such a huge, big production, you know, with uh, and so huge, big, and with taste. It was not something, you know, that was a uh, uh, cheap. But it was sophisticated, for sophisticated and popular, sophisticated and mainstream. And this equation, these two words, as remain in my life, in my brain. Sophistication, haute cuisine for mainstream. It's something that I really uh, think still today that anybody, any audience deserve haute cuisine. Everybody need to taste something that is sophisticated, beautiful. This is what I think is the real revolution. It's to bring, to bring the culture to everyone. And so I saw Siegfried and Royce, but in the same time, very fast, we start to work on Treasure Island. And it was the time where, you know, I, I, I will never forget when uh, Steve Wynn was bringing me in downtown Las Vegas and telling me his story with Frank Sinatra, a lot of beautiful story. Imagine how me, coming from a small village in Italy, then a post-industrial city in La Louvière, and being there in Las Vegas, telling all these 
hearing, listening, all these stories that I have seen in uh, on TV or in film, I was seeing live the film that I was, uh, you know, imagining. And so when we start the Treasure Island, it was the time where Las Vegas tried to to uh, become, I would say, Disney for adult, and. So for a while, the pirate show, the volcano at the Mirage, you know, imagine when I start with Cirque in Montreal, I felt that I was in a place where history was happening. When then we had the privilege to go in Las Vegas, I felt the same thing, that we were there in a time where history was happening. It, it, I felt that we were part of something that was, you know, really a moment of in the human history. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I don't tell you all the, because it was, a, this is an anecdote, you know, being, going in Las Vegas with the way we think and the way I was thinking at the time, when I had to ask Steve that, okay, we're gonna open the show but then, Steve, I would like to spend time in the room with the audience, listening the show. What do you mean, listening the show? You know, and uh, yeah, I say, Steve, you cannot do a show if you don't. A show, it's a partner with the audience. You have the show and the audience, and it was fantastic. That you know, it took some time. I remember I spent. I, I swear, God, I spent one month seated with Steve in the uh, theater. In theater, at the time, we call it showroom. You could not call it theater. And then we, we start to call it theater. So I spent one month with Steve watching so many shows, Treasure Island, and, you know, explaining to, trying to explain to Steve what I meant, what I wanted to do, and and, and isn't it true, not to interrupt you, but this is, isn't it true that at some point when you were working on the stair, maybe it was the creation that you actually banned Steve Wynn from coming to see it until you invited him? Is that true? Is it absolutely true? <laughs> but me, of course, you know, as well, the, the relation I have when I, you know, I was doing a show that at the time cost so much, you know, it was huge budget, a theater. But if I was, you know, I don't mean that I was not conscient. I was responsible. I was very lucid and cautious. That was a big responsibility, but I could not live with this pressure and really think out of the box. I had to be playful, although the pressure was strong. And it's true, oh, we have stopped. Uh, ah, so sorry, yes. my phone yes. is, I try to, sorry yeah. about that. It's okay. And so it's one time we were in the creation because I explained to Steve, we are doing creation. It's not a rehearsal because a rehearsal it's when you have done the show that you rehearse, you repeat. And so one day I was uh, uh, in the theater and I was walking i was uh, with my microphone and i was and i heard a lot of noise uh, going around and i understood that it was the announcement that steve was coming in the room and so everybody the technician the actor everybody was you know uh, stressing everybody was uh, shaking and then uh, i say I don't want anymore that Steve come while I am doing the creation. And you know, Steve understood. Steve had, has a relation with artists. He loved to be surrounded with artists. And I remember that I really was very, um, uh, very privileged to be able to have dialogue with him and explain to him why I didn't want him to come. It was not because of him, it was because of the authors. And, and he got this, he understood this, and then we, you know, we did what we, we had to do. So, so Mysterious, obviously, 
one of the most successful shows. I mean, it, it is the most successful show. It's still running. I don't. Is it twenty something years? It's it's yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. What's that? Ninety three. Ninety three. That's unbelievable. Um, but then you had a next huge challenge, right? So you have all that is wild success with Mister. You kind of redefining what entertainment is in Las Vegas, and now you're asked to kind of do something different, top yourself. You have a bigger budget and the idea is born, we are gonna do a theater show in water. And how did the genesis, how did that come about and, and, and how much pressure was that on you? Because at that particular time, we didn't spend 100, spend $200 million on shows. And that was the most expensive show probably ever. What was that like for you? And and how did you how did you work within those boundaries to create? Because it was completely different than how you grew up. You didn't have that those dollars to do these crazy ideas. And it had a it had a completely different context. No one performed the show in water before. Yeah. Without people like Steve, like Guy, being audacious and have a vision, you, you do nothing. So you need to fit and you need to, <laughs> to have the same kind of level. And uh, on O, we work a lot of time on another concept. Steve wanted to have a big lake and have a, a show with uh, with big stunt and and so it happened one day after one week of workshop i went to a greek restaurant in uh, <laughs> las vegas and with michel cret the set designer and i expressed to him how unhappy i was with the idea of a big lake and i was ex explaining to michel you know michel i think the big league, it's not a theater, it's not a show, it's something else. It's a stunt, it's a live stunt show, but it's not theater. And the water, it's not a theatrical, it's not an element. When you put a water on stage, it becomes something else. It becomes a metaphor. And so it's where we changed. And so after the lunch, we went back to the, uh, the, the, the room, the meeting room. And in the afternoon, we exposed this to Steve and Guy and everybody telling them we have found the show. And it happened in one lunch where we did the storyline. We did really, oh, 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 we, the, we changed the paradigm. We changed completely the approach and we say we need to be in a theater, but we want to open the, sh the, th the, the, the curtain different. And I took a scarf in my right hand and I put the scarf in my left hand and I say, I wanted the curtain open like this. And wow. Only this, you know, Michelle, wow. and all, all the team, you know, they have worked day after day to try to open the curtain like this. And I have to say today, if you ask Steve, who had the idea of bringing water uh, on, in a show? If you ask Guy, if you ask everybody, everybody will say, oh, it's me. And this is what makes a good idea. It's when everybody take and, and say that this is my idea, it means it's a good idea. But you had a witness. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Now, well, now, that, that, you know, <laughs> that moment, when that curtain flies away is truly like real magic. Um, it is probably one of the most iconic images. And you're all about images, tableaus. You're about taking fine art, you know, whether it's, you know, a director like Fellini or a, an artist like Dali and kind of creating these tableaus, these images that you can just sit and take a picture of every moment of the show and it would be a beautiful image that would say so much that speaks to um, the viewer. Because for you, 
what I gather knowing you and working with you, it's not about language as far as speaking English, French, Spanish, Italian. It's about the language of emotion. It's about connecting. And so when you watch this show and experience O, which is one of my favorite shows of all time, it really, that moment just sucks you in. And then you see the water, it's just so dramatic. And then the images of the horses and the carousel and the piano going down. Tell us how you create these unforgettable uh, tableaus. What is the process? How do you come? I, I know kind of because I spent time with you and I see the process, but explain to those who are watching now how you conceptualize and bring to fruition these incredible images that look like paintings coming to life. Yeah. So, you know, I have to say, O is the show that is the closest to me. And is, a, I think, whatever show we do, as a, you, me, any other people or artist, a painter, a musician, when you start to create a show or you start to compose a music, you cannot deny who you are. And we, we, I really think, and again, this is the fantasy that I am uh, inventing myself. We are like, a, like an anthem. We are like a reception. We reception, we receive the information. We are a full soul, soul, body. And we, we, have, we are a spirit, we are a brain. And we receive, we are affected by the world, from the world, what we are going through now with this pandemic we we can you know every morning i try to wear a mask a, a smiling mask because i don't want to affect my my wife my kids and, and myself only by smiling it it helped me to face what is happening now and oh if you remember you have you know you have uh, a wedding, you have a funeral, you have uh, kids, you have uh, people running. Uh, it's yin and yang, life and death. Exactly, always, always, because I don't think that we, we can really love, you know, a, a smile, it's like uh, babies. When the baby smile, they have their muscle here, they, they smile, smile, and then they start to cry. And I think I like this kind of emotion. But you touch a point very important for me. We are looking, when I, we start with Cirque, and I knew that we were going into a medium that was a medium which was non-verbal, no dialogue. What I try to, to, to touch, to find, it's a universal language. I still believe today that we all have one fundamental universal common language and through the images through you know if you look at, at the sunset you will be moved by the sunset you will be maybe happy or sad depending of what you are going through in your life and i think wherever you are in the world we have the same unique fundamental common language and so i say okay i need absolutely to work these pictures. I need to, to work and to create images that think, images that talk to the audience, to, to give the spectator a place, a space where the spectator can really put himself or herself into it. For me, a show is like a, a mirror ball. And if you look at most of my show, it's a ritual now I, I put a mirror ball because it's my totem, it's my... Um, uh, Signature. Know, it, uh, yes, and it's something that, you know, it's a happiness, it's a, like a shaman, uh, talisman, talisman is the word in English. But the mirror ball, what it is, it is a little mirror all around the mirror ball. And for me, each spectator in the room has one piece of this mirror ball and can 
where the show can reflect his life, his uh, who he is. And so hope for me is this, and it's it's the way we try, the way I try to talk to people, to the audience, wherever we are, wherever. It's the same relation that you have with a piece of art, with a, a painting. There is no dialogue, but you feel an emotion. And it's where I say, okay, I think what is the social archetype are different. If you are in Japan, in China, or in uh, America, we have some social uh, rules. And this change depending on your culture. But there is something that will never change. It's what I call the emotional archetype. And this is what I think is the alphabet of the images that I try, the tableau that I try to, to it. I don't want to be pretentious, but I think poetry is what it is. It's, it gives the space to the reader, the space to imagine and to revisit his life. But how do you practically <laughs> take, what's the process for the folks that are watching right now? What is the process of creating a tableau like is it an image visual research? Is it ideas that you put in a, in, an, in a painting that you then try to get each department to bring to life? Like, what is the process of the tableau? I understand that one time you were in your hotel in, uh, in I think, Bellagio, and you were working on O, and you saw the housekeeping, cleaning things, picking things up. And then you had the idea of, I want to put housekeepers in O, which went around picking up the, the stuff that the artist took off and were putting them away. I mean, is that how you created that tableau and other tableaus or is it a longer process? Like, what is the process? Just explain it simple form for the folks that are watching. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we all start with a desire, a desire or an intuition. Then our work as a artist as director it's to empty ourselves today it's very common to hear about the full awareness you know meditation and and so the way i approach a uh, creation of a show is that oh we have a desire we have an intuition we don't know what it is we have a destination but we cannot find the word to explain. And something we have to be careful is that we have not to be blinded with, by the destination. Some people, if you take your car and you, you do 200 miles an hour, it's maybe too much, but uh, you, you, know, you don't see what is happening uh, on the side. You don't see what is in front of your nose. So doing a creation, doing a tableau, you need to bring everybody not to be afraid about reaching the not reaching the destination you need to force to help to guide the people to be passionate to to deal with the doubt to deal with the uncertainty because like that you need you you will be able to like a kid like a kid like a child you can transform whatever you have in front of you. And the uh, housekeeping lady, what was it? It was, you know, we had this problem to clean the stage. We could not, because it was risky to leave the, the clothes there, the costume, because for the people that would. So what happened at that time? Oh, I have this problem. And my brain start to work at, oh, who can do this work, uh, housekeeping? And so because- So you celebrate it. Yeah, we celebrate never, you know, especially housekeeping or worker, <clears throat> I will never, never put them in a bad situa situation. But what was important there is that I was at that time when we were doing that scenes, trying to solve that problem, I was there. I was full aware 
and in link and in sync with what's happening in front of my eyes. And I was not trying to solve a problem that was not in front of me. And this is what I mean by full awareness. It's a kind of meditation to be there. It's, it's what you did, started to do at the stair, if you think about it, because typically in theater, you have a backstage area that they hide the things that need to be done technically. And what you managed to figure out was when, we had a, when you had to set up the, uh, the, uh, the net, instead of trying to hide the people, you kind of celebrate it and, and you take those moments and you make a tableau, a transition, and, and don't try to hide it. Yeah, this is what uh, I understand what you mean by celebrate. Yes, whatever you do, when we did Mister, actually, we were coming from the big top, from the chapiteau to a, a stage. And on a stage, the meaning of the asset, meaning of whatever you do, is very different than in a big top. In a big top, you know, you can bring a, a trampoline, you can bring a board because you have a special characters that make this. They are technicians to do this, stage hand, and they have a costume. We call them the equipe de piste. And so when you are on stage, it's very different. You can't, cannot hide. Even if you would do a blackout, people, it's blackout is fantastic because people, you know, think what is happening. And so instead to hide or to try to hide, I decide to celebrate. And then it becomes part of the story. It comes part of the world that we are creating. You know, very often I tell to our performers, when you run from stage to backstage, always think that you never run from stage to backstage because the backstage, it's not in the brain of the audience. Backstage is the place where you can imagine a lot of things. So if you go out and you go backstage, you have to go in a certain mood. In a cer Same thing when you come from backstage, you come maybe from 20 kilometers. <laughs> you need to give this information to the audience. And it is same thing with the asset, the trampoline, everything you bring on stage has a meaning, has a, something you know, that you need to celebrate. You work with Cirque from 1985 until 1998. And then you made a hard decision to leave Cirque du Soleil to begin Dragon, to get recognized for the creative genius that you are, not that that was your intention, but to do your own productions the way that you saw fit. And uh, first tell us a little bit about what the this why you made that decision to leave um Cirque du Soleil and go out you know kind of on your own yeah there, there are there is two 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 reasons is that at least two reasons one was you know being far from my family and was something a little bit of a difficult because you know my family we came from the village in Italy and my father and my mother, they stay in Belgium and never get back to the village because of us, because of me, because of my sister, because they wanted my sister and me that we go to school. And so, although they wanted to go back to the village, they stay in Belgium because of us. And so me, when I left to go in Canada, it was really, very difficult for my parents to imagine that I was leaving the home where they were forced to be because of us. So I went in Montreal. I worked, uh, I mean, 15 years because it was, uh, you know, in 1999, we did the premiere of La Nuba in uh, uh, Orlando. And so when, first of all, when I went back in La Louvière, I went back with the an idea in my brain and uh, I did not really stop to interact with Guy and the Cirque. We still worked on, we had to work on the Beatles, by the way, I worked, uh, I worked two years on the Beatles and then 
I didn't you know. know. I, 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 you know, when I was in London and I was with Michel, Guy, Gilles, and we met the four of the four, Yoko, uh, um, uh, Paul McCartney. But my, Paul McCartney with his uh, uh, running shoes. Uh, Probably Yoko Ono or her yeah, son. Yoko Ono was there and, and um, uh, the. the they, George Harrison. George, George Harrison, very right. nice. Very and Ringo tender. Starr. Yeah, as a Ringo Starr. And so we were in, in a room in the hotel and then we were to go into the other room and I saw these people in front of me. You, it's something you cannot, you know, you shake, you know, <laughs> and and uh, so with Michel, Gilles, and Guy, we were working on on the show uh, of the Beatles, but uh, because the accident with uh, uh, Siegfried and Roy, the plan changed because they had to open the Mirage, and so I could not um, do the show at that date. It was too soon. So, and. Um, but this brings me another thing. One day I received a call from Yoko Ono and she brought me in New York and I went, you know, in the apartment of John Lennon and she took wow. me a lot of tea and she has a lot of drawing, painting of John Lennon and, and she wanted to do something with the, this material. Anyway, Silk has brought me to, to meet so many people, so great artists that is fantastic. And so, uh, what was your question? <laughs> are you, are you, <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I was yeah, just yeah, asking yeah. you, what was the reason why you decided to leave Cirque. You said it was two reasons. One, it was more family and personal. And then the other reason you didn't tell us yet. Yes, yes, yes. And so family and personal, and I wanted to, to give back to the city, uh, La Louvière, what La Louvière gave me. You know, it is here that I met artists uh, in La Louvière. And so that, and the other reason I have to say was that, um, uh, only in 1998, we did, oh, La Nuba. Uh, I did the movie. We, we, you know, many years in a row, we worked so hard. And also, uh, I, I, I wanted to, to ask uh, Guy and Daniel at the time to make a pause, to think about what would be the, not only the economic and the, the strategy, not only the economic plan, but also the artistic plan for the next five years. And I have to say that the Cirque was so, you know, developing so uh, such in a, such a big growth that um, uh, it was difficult for me not to take a pause and think about creation. The creation, you know, we did such a great work that I, I had a little bit, I was afraid that uh, Cirque would go to sell uh, its soul to to the devil, I was seeing at the time, and um, so I was just uh, I, I needed to be to have a pause and think about the impact that we had with Sir. What such a great message, you know, the expression of a, a community. Uh, it was not Sir was not only a show; was also a way to behave. Was really a, a spirit. Uh, and so I was afraid maybe to, to, to lose something. And uh, I, I just wanted to make a pause. And uh, well, voilà. in my humble opinion, uh, when Cirque du Soleil lost Franco Dragon, and I've said this publicly, they've lost their soul and their heart and their way. And I say that because, um, you know, of, them becoming a big machine and not having the vision to follow all of the different elements that are an integral part into a vision, into supporting a vision and the emotion of that vision from the lighting to the music, to the artists, to really breaking new ground. And I think when you were involved uh, with Cirque from 1985 to 1998, you broke new ground. You found new paths. You tried to go into areas that were unchart uncharted. And I think when you're in a space that is unsafe or you feel scared or you feel nervous, 
it either makes you rise to the occasion and deliver something that no one has ever seen before, or you retreat. And, you know, you left Cirque. And at the time, I, uh, you know, I was getting involved with Cirque, uh, with, with my show. And, you know, I know, and it's been very public, my experience with Cirque du Soleil. And, you know, it, it was very difficult for me because for me, it was a big bureaucracy and a big machine. And I never really talked about this specifically, but they never really respected my art or my fans. They try to hide that. And they, you know, wanted to create a show that had nothing to do with Chris Angel, Mind Freak, or really hardcore magic. It was, it was a different show and a different vision. What I'm really fascinated with as somebody who lived it for quite, quite a number of years, and by the way, I don't regret it. Uh, I learned as a human being and I learned as an artist and I would never be who I am today um, if it weren't for those experiences. They made me and shaped me to who I am today, as you were pointing out. Um, but, but I guess what I'm getting at, when you then were going to work on Celine's show, A New Day, and she is such a magnificent superstar has an enormous fan base that expects her to deliver what they want to hear, what they want to see and what they're used to. How were you able to respect her as an artist and respect the fact that you're trying to create a show and walk that tightrope yeah. between her and your, sh and your show and kind of having them coexist? Because unfortunately for me, that was not the case. And, and for, for Celine, fortunately for her, it was the case because you understood both. You know, for first, just uh, about Cirque, I have to say that, you know, I, I am nothing and nobody without Guy, Gilles, Daniel, all the people that were there. It was René, Dominique, it was an alchemy. It's a rare that in the world, you know, it happened, this alchemy. I think, and of course, after thinking, because, you know, as much with Cirque, I was really full of uh, everything. You know, I, when, I, then, when I, I launched my company in Belgium, I have to say, it was the worst experience of my life because I, I had to deal, you know, with the entrepreneur and with the artist. And uh, what uh, when I was with Cirque, you know, they surrounded me, and they we we built it together. But they surrounded me, and I was in a way protected, and so I could really give my blood to to Cirque. And it's a without the vision of each of single people, I could not have the support to be audacious. And what happened in any company, because I remember when I was talking about Cirque, and I will go to Celine after, when I was talking about Cirque at the time, I see my best show, or I think the best show we have done, is to create 5,000 uh, employment, 5,000 job. jobs. Yes, Cirque has changed, you know, this is from a little uh, community in Quebec, they have changed the, the world of entertainment. And so this, it's fantastic. But whenever a company starts to grow, it starts to become an institution. And the risk, you know, I, I remember when the receptionist uh, in um, Montreal, the first years, when she was saying, hello, here, Cirque du Soleil, I knew that in her brain, she had the uh, images, the picture of the show. She was connected with the show. Then growing, it's the distance between you and what you work for become, become very long and you, 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 there is the risk, you know. Um, and so, although I understand what, uh, you might have experienced there. And uh, 
this is something you know that it's um, the danger for every institution sometime to not be focused or not understand or miss uh, something with Celine we, what ha happened is that Celine was surrounded also with people that was protect protecting her and you know imagine Celine she is the artist she is the raw material she is the one that thanks to her that everything exists so as usual, I approach this in a very humble way. And uh, just what I told before about the full awareness, I don't project something on somebody or on Celine. I try to understand and to pull out of her what she was, what she is, because whatever she was doing on stage was seen. You know what, what is beautiful in Celine is that she is not uh, done by with uh, with steel. She is not an iron woman. She is a she is a she is a human, and this is extremely uh, touching because her humanity, she and also of course her unique voice, her talent. You know, w before to start the re the rehearsal or creation session when she was doing the sound check with the with the or the band you cannot imagine how fun she is you know she can do any kind of joke and i have to say shilin if i regret something one thing i regret i really think that celine is a great actress and she can in uh, incarnate she can be different character really and this is pity that this has not been explored with her and um, you know uh, this was the limit I, I i had the dream with her to have her you know in a different character i want her to see her in a very old woman i want to see i wanted to see her in a, a young uh, strong uh, uh, teenager she can do many thousand character and it is why the audience like her because she is all the public she is everybody but this has not been uh, i had not the chance to push until there you know we had to close uh, in a way or another but the first thing was to respect her and not impose her who she was not it's to really to be to pull out of her what she is but she don't only do that with Celine. That has been your mantra ever since you worked with artists is, is you, you try to look at what their strengths are and you try to ask that question, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> and basically utilize who they are to the strength of your productions. And that is really a testament to your greatness. It's a simple fundamental thing, but it's the human connection just when you're working with somebody to see what they can bring to the table as opposed to somebody that's closed-minded and doesn't think of that. And I think that is why, um, you know, artists like Celine and others and everybody and like myself, you know, have a, a tremendous respect for you because you embrace and you, you're like, uh, 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 you're in a situation where you want to learn, you want yeah. to understand, and you won't stop with that kind of thinking until the day you die. You always feel like every day you can learn something more. You can learn something about this person. You can utilize the world to allow you to, to inspire you. And I, I think that's, that comes with that sincerity and that childlike, I always say that about you. I always say, he thinks like a child, you know, and I, and I think that innocence of that thought is why um, you were able to respect Celine and, and put together such a magnificent show um, only to then have to create another Steve Wynn show over at mm -hmm. Wynn with Larev, which then I became 
a small grain of sand on the beach with, but I had the honor of, of seeing that process in your studio at Dragon in La Louvier, Belgium. And uh, it was, you know, awe inspiring to say the least. And this is before Mind Free came out or anything. But I'd love you to talk a little bit about going back to the water, but this time in the round, in an intimate space, even though it was a large venue. Um, what was that like? Uh, I'm sure that was its own set of challenges, not just the water, but because of being in the round. And Steve Wynn obviously had a vision of his own. It was probably trying to uh, make sure that uh, that what was important to him was in the show and he spent a lot of money on it. So can you just take us through the Larev experience? Yeah, so we, when uh, uh, Steve uh, developed uh, the win <clears throat> and uh, we, we developed, we worked on uh, uh, two shows. One was an outdoor show and one was indoor show. Then what happened, it was uh, September 11, and uh, Steve uh, uh, unpulled the plug and said, we cannot develop two shows, let's do one show. And we had to choose between the indoor show that was with no water or the outdoor show that was with water. Because, you know, I didn't want to have another water show because O was uh, they, there every every day, so I did not want. And so what happened is so that at that time where we were when we were thinking about what would be the show that we would develop, in the same time, Cirque was developing Ka, and I heard that Ka would have been a technological uh, wow, you know, uh, audacious and a breakthrough. And so I say, okay, if car will be a technological breakthrough, let's do the rev based on human proximity, close, on really be, be as close as possible. It's why there is this kind of intimacy, intimacy, you know? And so we all was a beautiful journey, but it's where maybe it happened that the people surrounding Steve was, you know, when we, when we opened uh, Le Rêve, we were not ready. And uh, <clears throat> there was maybe a misunderstanding between the show where we were at and the audience. I remember the day of the premiere, the show was not ready, it had to grow. So, and, but the show, the Le Rêve is really one of uh, the show where I tried to be maybe too audacious, to, to go too far, too fast, and break all the boundaries and uh, the human relation. There was, for instance, no male or female. There is no, uh, no um, distinction between gender. Uh, everybody, you know, uh, my intention was really to break everything about racism, uh, homosexuality, uh, xenophobia. We are one, and because we are one, every relation is the same with everybody. And so we were doing maybe, I was there maybe two, two uh, I would say, too avant-garde in the acting, in the choice of character, too audacious for Las Vegas at that time. I had to plan, maybe I was too fast at the limit how far the entertainment can go in uh, Las Vegas. And the, the version of Le Rêve at that time that I still love this version was not enough uh, playful or not enough uh, it was darker. Uh, yes, that's the word. It was too dark at that moment. Today, I think it would be totally uh, uh, casual, but it was too dark at that time. Uh, Let me ask you, if I may interrupt you for a second, Franco. Yes. What, what do you do 
when you're working on something, you have an idea in your head, you spend all this time, energy, and money, all people from your team are working on it, and then you finally see it physically in front of you, and it doesn't work the way you thought it would. What do you do? And what was something that, as an example, that was like that, that you, and how did you deal with it? Oof, this is, uh, you know, um, and maybe you feel the same thing, but uh, it, uh, while I do a creation, it's where, you know, you see in front of your eyes the, the gap that exists between your desire, your wish, and the reality is uh, like, uh, it's like, you know, missing your life. It's very, very tough, very difficult. Uh, and uh, you try, you know, to, you, you need to, to find a way to be tolerant towards you. And you need to, then it's the time where myself, I try to grab someone and, and be uh, reassured. So I want to hide myself under the table. I want, <laughs> I want to have very close friend around me just to tell me, don't be discouraged, try again. It will be better tomorrow. It will be better tomorrow. But the insatisfaction that you create in one show it's also the, the energy for the next show. We cannot solve all the problem in one life. Uh, you need several life to solve problem. It's why I used to say that I do on, always the same show because uh, I always try to solve a problem that I had in a show, a previous show. And uh, it's a very difficult time. And we have to be careful. The most dangerous time, it's when your show is successful. If your show is successful, what happened? It happened that, and this has happened to, to me, the cast, the technician, everybody is happy. And then you stop to work. No, when the show is successful, it's where you have to work much more. It's not... You know, you, you understand? It, sure. People stop. I work, work harder now than I did when I was trying to make it because but, uh, to remain uh, the most relevant at your craft takes a lot more time, effort, and energy than it is to try to get there. The destination yeah. is, is, is far greater, or the journey is far greater than a destination. Um, and it, it's much more enjoyable. But once you're there, now you, to maintain it and to maintain such a high level and you have a target on your head, it takes a lot more dedication, work, and passion. Yeah, for instance, I have a question for you, Chris. How you deal, how you deal with, you know, when you open the show, the day of the premiere, and you have people that come to you and say, ah, oh, bravo, I have, fantastic, and uh, how, uh, so how you deal with that, although you know that you are not happy, because you did not reach what you wanted to reach. So how you deal with this very sad moment? It's, For me, it's, 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 it's really sad. That's, that's the story of, 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 of my being. It's I'm never happy. It can always be better. Yeah. And uh, 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 for me, I try to work even harder. Perfection is like water. You can't hold on to it. And it's something that you work as a human being and as an artist to perfect, but it always can be better. And that's why live is such an incredible experience because no two audience are alike, no two shows are alike. And so for me, it's always trying to reinvent, trying to um, look at what's going on in the world how does it affect the audience? How does it affect me? Because that relationship is the magic of emotion. It's the most important magic that I do. It's yeah. the connection. And that raw human emotion really will have an audience walk away and not care about how I do it, 
but rather how they feel when they watch it. Mm -hmm. And to me, I just, I'm never happy. And that's with, with my, with my work, I'm never happy. It could always be better. And I think that that's innate in most people that achieve success in their respected discipline. Like you, you can never be happy. If you're happy, then you might as well retire. Yeah, yeah. So when people come to me and say, great show, that was awesome. That's it. I thank them, but I'm like, yeah, but this wasn't right in there. Or yeah, but this is still going in. Oh yeah, this was still working on this. I'm never like, and people always say to me, like, why aren't you just happy with, it was great. And I'm like, no, it, it, this, wait, come back and see it with this. And I'm like that in everything I do. I'm building a model miniature world right now. And I'm almost done. I worked on it since the pandemic. And I look at it and I'm like, for two seconds, I get the self the satisfaction, but then I'm like, oh, that could be better. That could be better. It's the same with you. You create a show, you work years, you bring it to life. There it is. Your vision is coming to life. You, you're impressed by it for a moment. You appreciate it for a moment. And then you say, yeah, but that can be better. That we need to change that. You start picking it apart, but that's the, the sign of a perfectionist. That's why you are who you are. That's why I aspire um, to be better because of you and what you contributed to, to theater. So, you know, and in the same thing, I always say you try to make lemonade out of lemons. And I'm sure you've had this happen where you've had an incident, a mistake happen that actually is a blessing in disguise. The mistake actually guides you or showed you something that you never would have thought of. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, and just to, to, to close the chapter of a premiere, you know, it's not good to have me in a premiere because I am only sad. And it's pity because people need to, to make party. And uh, this uh, sadness, and I see, you know, you have a face where even if you smile, you Chris, there is always a, a sadness behind your eyes. This is maybe our life is this. It's a tragic comedy. And right. so it, it's a, and about what you, you say, you know, again, and I think this happened to, so to accept, to be uncertain it means that if you do a day when there is a day of creation and at the end of the day i have seen what i was expecting for me it's a sad day i but when i have something that was not expected and <gasps> surprise me that's a fantastic day so how to provoke this this is what it is how to provoke and it's always to put you at risk and i call it shake the stage uh, when when it happened in creation and i have to say you know creation sometimes can last three four five six hours and thanks god we have the stage manager damien when he was the stage manager that called me oh, you need to stop you need to stop and uh, but uh, you know when you, you are on stage and you see that uh, nothing is happening, or if you see that what you were planning happened too fast, too soon, then you give you the opportunity to shake the stage, to discover things that was not expected. And this is the best moment. And this is what I mean by the happy accident or gift of gods. How to provoke gift of gods? How to provoke God to send you gift in front of your eyes and capture this? It's a, this is what I, I think is our way to taste a little bit what eternity could mean. It just, this was not expected. You provoke a gift of God is there and what happened in front of your eyes, it's all the constellation getting at the same time together the actor come there a movement and i said this is the what make me really love the creation moment i hate when you know we when i 
we go toward the opening, the door, it happened in uh, uh, Wuhan, when Wuhan was the first city where we opened the show. I remember we were hearing the audience at the door, wanting to come in, and I was still uh, on, uh, on stage to deciding, I had to decide what would be the best note I could give to the cast to make, to solve a problem that was, that would need three days to solve. And mm. you need 20 minutes before you open the door to decide the right words, to tell the right notes, you know, to, that might change the complete perception of the show. And this is the beauty of our job. But you need then, you know, it, it, pleasure always comes with uh, sadness. It's something that has always, if you don't take risk, you, you will never achieve anything. So, and I love, I have to say that I love when something is growing, non, non, not when it has reached the final stage, you know, because the chance with the tree, the tree goes until the blossom, but then the year after it come back. But our life, it's not like this. We blossom once and same thing in the creation, in what we do. I think every day it's a new life. Every day it's a new show, every day. And for instance, in your show, I don't understand how you can do, you know, the same Rig, same, um, very rigorous, and but every day the, the audience is different. Every day it's a new audience, and at the same time you need to have the same boundaries, same the same place. So where is the space where you can improvise, where you can talk with the audience? Where it's very limited our freedom space. It's why we try to go deeper instead to go. Uh, why, you know, it's, a, it's, I think it is in the intensity of this transition moment that we have in, in, uh, in uh, creation, talking about uh, the kind of show I do. Uh, it's um, actually, well, uh, it's, a, it's the best moment at the same time, the most, the most excessive moment. And every director is different. But one thing I can say is that I can't do a show without excess. I need to be excessive on me to be able to provoke the destiny, I would say. Do you um, find yourself when you're creating a show, making the show longer so you have the opportunity to cut out what the audience doesn't respond to, but you still have enough running time? Yeah, it, it happened also the opposite. One, uh, sometime, when you don't have enough uh, uh, enough substance, uh, you, you need to find, and, and then you see where it is, you know, sometimes too much, but, you know, a show always shrink, always, uh, I mean, this, this depends on show. For me, there is no, you know, the right time for a show. Uh, before in, in Las Vegas, we were 92, 90 minutes, uh, now it's apparently 75 minutes. A show could be too long even after five minutes. And it, it could be too short even after two hours. So um, it, it's, uh, it's the right foot for the right shoes, the right shoes for the right foot. It's very tricky. There is no recipe. And you, just a couple of more questions. You, you, a couple of quick questions. You uh, say, Ordinary creates extraordinary. Yeah. Explain I, that. Yeah. For me, I mean, um, our mission is to the audience, we have to give the extraordinary. How to make something ordinary extraordinary? It's from a, the point of view you give and you look to something simple. I mean, the eyes of somebody, the smile of a child in, in the life, Everything uh, uh, we need to sublimine the mag magnify what is human, what is humanity, and this is our mission, our job to do this. 
And it's why sometimes a smile can be, you know, uh, uh, ordinary person can become extraordinary. Now, from one of the books you love, Peter Brook, The Empty Space, he says, reality is a word with many meanings. Do you have any other uh, passages that you love from that book? You know, uh, Peter Brook, uh, I mean, that book teaches me to look at the space that there is not only in a theater that you can do uh, theater. It's how to, to make a place, a location, become a place where you can tell a beautiful story when you where you can create a theater the empty space for me mean also the empty space that you need to leave to the audience because the audience has to have this space to be able to imagine their own story if you fill all the space if you tell if you put everything on the nose of the audience i mean there is no space for the fantasy and i love Robert Lepage, when he say he says that uh, the most visual medium is the radio, because <laughs> when you listen, your to imagination. It, yeah, you, you imagine, and uh, it's what I, I love. You know, this is what we have to do. We have to give the space uh, with enough emptiness for people to be able to feel it with their. This is the real interactivity. How do you feel about people that have blatantly tried to copy what you've created, even the whole, you know, Cirque du Soleil um, and those images and the concept behind what the characters do and just, you know, these acts that are put in there with, you know, tableaus. I mean, there's so many of these. Uh, companies out there, what should, do you have any feelings? Do you, do you, do you look at it as flattery or does it annoy you that they're trying to not even give you credit and take your, you know, your artistic um, prowess and exploit it? Well, I, I think I, I love, I love when, I like when people copy. I don't, I mean, uh, ideas are something that you can give for free. It's something that can be, you know, shared. But what you're gonna do with the the idea this is something different. And where I am a little bit, you know, sometimes upset is that, oh, how a, an idea become cheesy or cheap. This is uh, most dangerous, more dangerous, more uh, offending because it might, you know, you get the credit of something that is not what you did. But if people take ideas, I mean, it's very good and it's, uh, but it's really the way you do this. The way that as it is used after might change the, the seed. And this it's, uh, I don't like very much. Well, the seed gets changed because the seed wasn't born in you. When, you, when you're the creator of something, then you understand the meaning behind it, right? And when somebody just takes an idea, they, they can't, they can take the idea, but they can't steal the heart and the soul of where that idea, the idea came from. That, I, think that's, I think that's the problem and it, then it becomes plagiarism. But I was just curious. And then what, what are your thoughts about back in the eighties or when you, when you did the, the Nouvelle Experience and then Mystere later on, um, audiences, how have they changed over the decades? Like, what, what is the audience like today compared to when you first opened up your first show in Vegas? You know, the, 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 today I see, you know, today, since uh, 15 years, uh, we are hearing about, you know, new technology, missing, uh, immersive, a lot of, blah blah about uh, uh, gadgets and I think always theater in the history of theater always theater has integrate the modernity so as a theater maker as a live performer as a show maker we are integrating any tool that can help to talk about life so yes, technology, new technology, it's fantastic. And it is, uh, when it is well used, can really convey the right, 
the, the, the same effect that you were doing um, years ago. I love the empty space. An empty stage is the best uh, special effect for me. But the audience nowadays, of course, it's, has a lot of information. And I don't like the shows that I call, whatever is the title of the show, there is always a tagline that I add is that uh, this show was about the best of YouTube. Because on YouTube, you see a lot of things. Creativity is everywhere. Everywhere you can find creativity. Everybody's doing it. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, I love there is one uh, <clears throat> Brazilian um, director, the uh, name uh, is passed away now, Augusto Boal. And he talked about, there is a book where he says, even actors can do theater. It, it was just a, explaining by the absurd that non-actor can do theater. And so it's good when I see on YouTube uh, all these uh, ideas and very fast it become gadget for me because I mean- it's, Or a trend, uh, or a trend. A trend and a trend lasts just the time of a whisper. And if we try to be trendy, it it's, it's doesn't, uh, and it's why it's difficult to resist to some producer or investor that tells, oh, you know, uh, I want to have this, but this, it's always something than he has seen somewhere else. I prefer when, you know, when somebody want ex express a desire with no many words, just a desire simply because if you try to be trendy, I mean, it just, um, you will last the time of a whisper. And our job is to be ahead because to be ahead, to be long-term, you need to understand now, today, and not try to be trendy. This is my right. well, one hundred percent. And you know, if if you, uh, it all comes down to the emotion and the connection. And if the art and the images that you create, the tableaus that you create, connect to people on an emotional level, then you utilize these tools to support it. But it can't be. Uh, the only thing because if you have that then you have you know shows that don't work and close very quickly um but what do you think because audiences are more sophisticated because of technology and their attention spans are a lot shorter today than they were um years ago um you still have the human emotion which is the most important thing but Audiences have to be a bit different today than they were five or 10 years ago. So just by the pacing of a show, do you think the pacing of a show or the, the opening or the structure of it, and it has to be great, no question about it, but do you think any of those things need to, when O came out, it kind of, reimagine live theater do you think there's going to be you said immersive you said all of these things that now pop artists use i use in my show um but do you think that that will become part of the language as we go into the future that support the emotion of 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 for the audience to, to connect to because do you think an audience in the future will still connect to a show that that would have happened 20 years ago, 15 years ago? Uh, I think we, the, the audience, you know, learn to, to read, to get many information at the same time, and that's true. And so it changed the pacing of the show. But again, it, uh, this is something, you know, that um, is, uh, you, you, you can, we cannot underestimate the audience. And, uh, the pacing of a show, it's not only an equation to solve. It's a really, I mean, there is no recipe. The way I think I can compare, you know, you have a recipe and then you try to cook based on the recipe. I prefer to put my finger in the sauce and taste it 
it gives me, you know, the pacing of a, of a show. But of course, uh, the same thing, if you have a big screen, you need to shoot and to edit your movie in a certain uh, certain number of frames because it takes more time for your eyes to follow the action. If the screen is smaller, it goes faster, you need to adapt your rhythm. So I think we have to keep on going to be connected with the world. We have to be uh, intelligent, oh, no, I would say, as a director, I try to be an experienced uh, spectator. But I, I, have to, I try to be the first spectator of the show and try to gather uh, and integrate all what is happening now in the world, the technology, uh, everything. But it's a fantastic to play with these toys. For me, our toys that I play with, like I was playing with chairs when I was a kid and doing a train. So today, I like to see in uh, an LED screen the wire that are inside. <laughs> And so I like to, to see what a pixel make, and maybe the pixel can be something interesting and never take things uh, as granted and always shake. This is what I try to do to understand the mystery of life. Even in a, in a, in a props, there is a, like a kid, try to transform and use a chair can become a building a human can become a dragon. Uh, I remember one director, a story about a director, and this might be, I, I, I won't say a conclusion, but I remember that a director tried to do a, a scene, a fight scene between uh, two uh, fighters and two knights. And they had, you know, they, they had to fight and, and um, the scene was not enough epic. They, they were big, fantastic stunt people, but it was the, the, no, the, the director did not know how to talk to the performers, to the actor. And one day he came back and he said, okay, I will tell you this now, you are, a dragon and you are a mountain. And he told this at the ear of the actor one and the ear, so it did not tell, told this uh, loud. And so the one that was playing the dragon and the one playing the mountain, they start to fight and finally it became an epic fight, an epic combat between two knights that were human. But as human, they were not able to translate the strength that the director was mm. looking for. You know? Interesting. One very last question. I want to thank you so much for all of the time that you so generously bestowed upon all of us watching this. This has been an incredible opportunity for us all, including myself. And I just want to thank you for that opportunity. My last question is, what is next and in the future of Franco Dragon? Uh, you know, I don't know, <laughs> except I don't know, but uh, uh, next is for me to multiply the number of time where I can spend like tonight, Chris, I spent the time with you, not thinking about what was happening after, not before, I was here, I was here and we were talking like this, although I was stressed at the beginning, you know, we had the screen and things like this. Next is uh, uh, doing as much, it's to spend only, you know, on 24 hours, I would like to spend at least uh, 23 hours doing theater creation and thinking about the show, which has not been what I had, I could do during this last 20 years because as an entrepreneur, I, I was schizophrenic the i have forgot i have lost a little bit the artist he, he has been you know i and this is i remember when i was a kid i was doing my homework in the kitchen on the corner of a table and these last 20 years i was thinking about this i was doing creation on the corner of a table because i had to to deal with the management and all the 
And it's why I will never be enough thankful to people like Guy, uh, Gilles, Daniel, uh, Steve, uh, all my friends and all these people that have given me the opportunity to be an artist. I would not be nothing without these people, nothing without, you know, it's not a flattery uh, person like you. And um, the first, you know, although I am, I say I am, I think I, I, I try to be an experienced spectator. Also, I'd like to be fan. I am a fan of some people that admire, respect, and I want maybe to copy them as a person. I, I like to copy the behavior of some person because when they are respectful, when they are true, real, this is something that um, make me wake up in the morning because I want to be to learn and to meet people like uh, you and be part of the world like what we are trying to do with the Creator United. And uh, thank you, Brian, Frank, thank you, David, and thank you, everybody. And in Italy, when you finish a show, at the end, at the beginning of the Commedia dell'arte show, there is always two characters come, or one character come and say welcome to the audience. And at the end, there is always one character that come and the other join her or him and say, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, to have been with us tonight. And we hope we enjoyed and we wish you coming back next time because our life is this. Our life is not to beg. We don't beg. We give you our talent. The only thing that will remain will be our talent. And this is what we try to, to do. It's to give our talent to, to the world. And uh, voila. Well, thank you so much, uh, Franco. Um, it's been an amazing experience, and this is just the first episode of many. On behalf of Las Vegas Creators United, I'm Chris Angel, and thank you so very much for watching. Hey, this is Chris Angel. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Please unite with us and help the Las Vegas entertainment community. It's easy to do. Just go to dragon.com and click on the donate button. A little bit will go a long way. Thanks so much for watching.